Yeah, I'm delighted to uh, introduce our speaker today, Daryl Ireland. I'll give his academic uh, introduction, then my personal introduction. He's a research assistant professor of mission and associate director of the Center for Global Christianity and Mission at Boston University. And he has his PhD from Boston University, where he's been now for uh, 13 years, he just told us. Personally, uh, my family got to know him when he was a next door neighbor living in Taiwan, and he was very young, new missionary in uh, Taiwan at the time. And he still likes a, looks like a young new missionary in Taiwan, so don't know what's going on. I, I've gotten, uh, but uh, they had their son was born while they were in Taiwan, and uh, they were wonderful neighbors to have. Uh, I am really excited to invite him. Uh, one of our topics for the PhD colloquium is contextualization, and. He has produced a uh, book on John Song, John Song, Modern Chinese Christianity and the Making of a New Man. I hope we'll be able to link that on the uh, chat so you can see where that's available at uh, Amazon. But I, to me, that's the best academic book that's been done on John, John Song. And it's done a lot of the work in dealing with the mythology of John Song, trying to get through that to who's the real person. And I think it's so well done because at the same time we see what might not be so real. We see that what is real is extremely valuable and an amazing man, um, even when we take away some of the mythology that has built up around him. And so maybe the best book on John Song, I would say, definitely the best academic book. Um, we asked him to talk about contextualization because that's our topic. And he really... Uh, got a lot of interest from us because he says that ultimately uh, contextualization was not something that John Song did, but something he required of his listener. So we'll see if that's what you end up addressing today, but we're looking forward to that. So thank you so much for being with us. And let's, can we go ahead and get the time then? Yeah. Okay, so John Ireland, you live in Taiwan for how long? Uh, for five years. Wow, no wonder you look like a next door neighbor. <laughs> I come from Taiwan as well. I show pray. I we're going to pray. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you. We thank you for today's time. Uh, we want to commit uh, the following time and uh, Dr. Ireland into your hands. And uh, we praise the Lord because uh, Dr. John Song is a spiritual giant. And moreover, he has a very uh, strong influence uh, for the development of a Chinese church. So, Lord, we thank you uh, for uh, having Dr. Uh, Ireland uh, to do this kind of research. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you're going to give us a humble heart and listening ears so we can learn how to uh, learn from his uh, study, Dr. The, the Ireland's uh, study, and moreover, help us so we can think about how to contextualize uh, whatever we learn, that is about theology or Bible uh, practice uh, in our um, church life and in our family life and in our personal life so we can learn how to help the church to grow deeper further having deeper love for you as well we thank you and love you in jesus name we pray amen amen i'll uh, we'll give the time over to dr Ireland. great wow well thank you so much for having me here today this is a real privilege and an honor for me and I'm grateful to Dean Swan for the de generous invitation to talk about Song Shangjie and the contextualization of the gospel. She's given me the opportunity to really slow down, take some time to consider and distill some of my own thinking on this important topic of contextualization. And she's allowed me to explore the theme before all of you, really, and ideal or a dream audience. You need to understand, rarely do I have the chance to talk to people who have ever heard of John Song or Song Shangjie. And here today, I have a group of people that I imagine not only know who he was, but can tell me more about his life and ministry. And so I'm very excited about this and grateful for the remarkable gift that you've given. So thank you uh, for organizing this time. I also want to express my thanks to Dr. Richard Cook 
who really was a wonderful neighbor and friend in Taiwan years before. He became a model for me on how to combine faith and scholarship or demonstrated what it means to be a supportive colleague. And so Rick, thank you so much for making today happen. And it's also important to mention all the work that Tracy Bai did behind the scenes. Um, despite the distance between us, Boston and Los Angeles, she made me feel both comfortable and confident because she always supplied me all the information I needed well ahead of time. So thank you, Tracy, for the work that you've done. And finally, let me express my appreciation to all of you who have attended um, this lecture. I know that we live in a time when at any given moment, multiple people and responsibilities ask for your attention. You have reading you need to do, probably right now. Uh, emails that await responses, sick people to visit, family members who want just five minutes of your time. I know you're being pulled in a hundred different directions, but you have chosen or maybe you've been required to sit in front of your computer right now and to give your time and your attention to this. And I thank you for making that a priority. And so although we've prayed, I'm going to invite you to pray with me again that God will accept this sacrifice of your time and ignite it with his holy presence. So let's pray together. Merciful God, we are so grateful that we are bound together as brothers and sisters through our Lord Jesus Christ, and that we can gather to try to understand more deeply the gift that you have given us in Jesus, our Savior. As we listen attentively, may we hear your spirit at work in the life of Song Shang Jie and the people in which he ministered to, and equip us for the ministry to which you've called us. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, give me a moment. I am going to try to slip, uh, share my screen. Um, and it would be at this moment that I can't find the actual thing I want to share. Hold on. I had closed what I had wanted to show you right after I practiced showing it. Great, great. All right, well, the topic, as you know, is Song Shang Jie and the contextualization of the gospel. Um, but I want to begin the talk by sharing with you two premises or two fundamental ideas that are going to be anchoring this talk. And first, is there is no such thing as a single or homogenous culture. That is, there's no one or truly what we might say authentic Chinese culture. Rather, there are many different subcultures that can all be considered Chinese. And the second premise is like the first. There is no single gospel. What I mean is the good news always depends on what the bad news is in any given situation. So two premises, there's no single culture and there is no single gospel. Let me illustrate it for you. In the 1920s, the Roman Catholic Archbishop in China mandated that the church contextualize the gospel. The results looked like this poster on the left. Christian images like this one became infused with traditional Chinese architecture, symbols, and clothes. At the exact same time, Protestants also worked to contextualize their message, but it looked totally different. And this poster on the right, you see the cross delivering a man from his traditional Chinese clothes in the top left corner, and now presenting him as a new creation in a white Western suit. How can both be examples of contextualization? 
I would argue that the Catholic poster recognizes the chaos of China's situation. Industrialization, urbanization, and commercialization are breaking up the traditional family, and they are creating new and harmful rules of conduct that encourage individualism, freedom from responsibility, and really a predatory posture that seeks to exploit or take advantage of the weak. Many Chinese people in the 1920s joined organizations, started new journals, revived ancient practices, and effectively created a subculture because they believed China was falling apart. Catholics offered these weary and worried souls the comfort of the gospel. Jesus restores all things. Meanwhile, the Protestant poster also recognizes the chaos of China's situation. The nation is being carved up by imperial powers and greedy warlords. Every effort to resist has failed. To keep trying the same things, the same old political solutions, military strategies, economic adjustments, or even playing by the same old moral rules is tantamount to surrender. To even wear the same old clothes as we see in this Protestant poster, to wear even the same old clothes is disastrous because the track record is obvious. If China doesn't change everything, then there will be no China at all. To the many Chinese people in the 1920s who created a subculture around the conviction that traditional China was bankrupt, Protestants offered these poor and panicked souls the hope of the gospel. Jesus makes all things new. Two posters and two different messages produced at the same time for China. Jesus restores all things and Jesus makes all things new. The differences in these images and their messages express something fundamental about contextualization. It is a process that is neither done once nor for all. Instead, contextualization is an ongoing conversation between the generative, abundant, and inexhaust inexhaustible gospel of God and the many facets and faces of our world's pluralistic cultures. I hope these posters will help you keep in mind my two premises. One, the gospel cannot be reduced or distilled to a single message, nor two, can something like Chinese culture be boiled down to one common set of beliefs customs, institutions, or behaviors. So let's keep those points in mind as we now look at someone who was gifted at contextualization. What did Dr. Song Xiangjie do to make the good news come alive for different audiences in this time period? I want to look at Song's contextualization in two parts. The first part will examine how he communicated the good news. The second part will look at what he communicated. It's important that we understand both his method and his message. Now, to be clear, when I talk about Song's method, I am not talking about what he did to take a biblical passage and then reformulate it in new terms and for a new audience. Right now, I am not interested in the particular mechanics 
of Song's contextualization. What I mean by method is what delivery method did he use to communicate the gospel? For example, when he first came back to China in the 1920s, I would describe his method as a patronizing lecture. He alternated between scolding villagers for their bad habits and bad hygiene and trying to woo them or excite them with convoluted and made-up phrases that he invented. But no matter how he poked or prodded or tried to woo an audience, he discovered that people were not interested in what he had to say. Like many others, Song learned that listeners become defensive when they are attacked by scolding them, and they're bored when subjected to lots of jargon. So Song's contextualization did not begin well, because initially he lectured people. But during his travels around Fujian in those early years, Song began to change the delivery method of his messages. He discovered that people like to share personal stories about their dreams, experiences with ghosts, angels and demons, visits to heaven, and audible voices when no one else was around. People were fascinated by the way the supernatural world intersected with the natural world. And the more unusual the experience, the more interest a person's story held. Now, Song realized that he had had a lot of bizarre experiences when he was in the ins insane asylum in the United States. Initially, he had been ashamed to talk about his hospitaliz hospitalization but he quickly learned how to use it. The fact that he was locked away became proof that his messages were not of this world. Doctors and teachers were the people most schooled in human wisdom. So how could they possibly recognize divine wisdom? Song asked. No wonder they thought he was crazy they were trying to fit the heavenly secrets God gave to Song into their small human categories. Song warned his listeners not to repeat that mistake. And that made many people curious to hear the stories of this so-called madman. Some found his stories silly, but others were slower to judge. Maybe there was something divine and mysterious about Genesis chapter 1, where Song explained that God revealed to him a secret message when he read about the waters above being separated from the waters below. Here's a quote. Water is H2O, Song informed his audiences. If you want it to become wine, you need to add carbon. So wine is C6H12O6. Water originally belongs to the earth. Carbon is found in the heavens. Now when they are brought together, wine is made. This is the meaning of the word made flesh. Such ideas may have been puzzling to some, but they were also interesting. Song's stories promised a kind of inside track on God's secrets. And that allowed his cryptic and sometimes hard to understand messages to hold people's attentions. But to be honest, they were able to do little more than hold people's attention. Telling people stories about his heavenly experiences was not enough to change them. The breakthrough in Song's delivery came when he adopted organized revivals. 
something he learned from the Bethel mission when he joined them in 1931. Thereafter, Song had a method that structured and powerfully communicated his transformational message. Organization began before he ever stepped foot into a revival. Announcements needed to first appear in the newspaper, preferably with explanations of what happened in other revivals, such as singing, shouting, confessing sins, and tears. For people who did not know what a revival was, these newspaper advertisements helped create a kind of script for how they should act. And then when the revival drew closer, flyers were printed and handed out on the streets. And a giant banner was hung over the hall or the church where Song would speak. Organization, uh, in other words, included advertising. And Song was borrowing all the techniques that department stores were pioneering in order to promote his services and make people see them as attractive and of kind of show. Now that meant that his revivals needed to be entertaining. Audiences were warmed up with peppy songs. When he traveled with the Bethel Worldwide Evangelistic Band, that meant one person pounded out notes on the piano while another amused the audience with exaggerated slides on his trombone. A church service prevented people from actually gliding or hopping around the building, so the crowd channeled the energy of China's dance halls into dancing, I mean, into clapping and singing the easy lyrics that accompanied Bethel's lively tunes. By the time Song strode to the center of the platform in his long traditional gown, a sense of anticipation hung in the air. He immediately captivated audiences with the look, technique, and mannerisms of China's popular traditional storytellers. He entertained crowds with props, exaggerated gestures, and mime. He delighted them with his ability to change the pitch and the quality of his voice as he mimicked various characters in his sermons. And just like a paid storyteller, Song would interrupt his speaking with a song when he wanted to reinforce an important point or when he needed to re-engage an audience's drifting attention. Now, people may not have realized where his stories were going at first. They probably just enjoyed how he could dramatically produce a pen from his sleeve and then use it to sketch a cartoon. Hypocrites, for example, had bulging eyes, huge flapping ears, big mouths, and enormous round bellies. Because, Song explained, Hypocrites can only see what is wrong with others. They hear, they strain to hear the mistakes others make. They speak critically and they eat and feast on the mistakes of others. Now, the addition of tiny hands and shrunken legs was enough to drive home the point. Hypocrites can do nothing. But if the picture wasn't enough, Song would act it out. He pulled in his hands and he would waddle about the stage ineffectively. And audiences laughed appreciatively as he mocked hypocrites. But then he moved to buckle their knees. The transition often happened suddenly. Song could be playing a clown to everyone's delight and then lower his icy stare 
and declare that those in the hall were all hypocrites. Had they not just proved that they only see what is wrong with others, enjoy hearing about someone else's failures, whisper about and then feast in their bellies on another person's wrong. To prove his point, he might press further. Do you hate, uh, uh, you sit, sorry, you sit here and laugh, he might say, at those who hate you. But do you, in fact, hate? Do you hate your father, mother, teachers, grandmother, mother in law, daughter in law, husband, wife? Do you hate your children? fellow workers, other students. Do you hate in your heart? Do you hate to the bone? Someone would then pause, waiting, waiting, until finally someone would indicate she knew the burning power of hatred. And then another and another would raise her hand. On and on it went women and men weeping in shame and remorse until Song was satisfied that hatred had been fully expelled. And then he would move on. Have any of you engaged in illicit sex? In one service, Song could strip an audience bare as he asked them pointedly and with great detail if they had committed dozens of different sins. His revivals were organized so that everyone could recognize the grip sin had on them. That was step one. Once that was sufficiently clear, Song moved into the second and shortest phase of a revival service. He invited people to come to Jesus. Leave your sins behind. Don't wait any longer, but come to the Savior now. After Song issued that climactic call for people to come to Jesus, the third phase of the revival began. The invisible wall that separated the audience, sort of the passive observers, from Song, the active performer, that wall suddenly collapsed. Everyone was now part of this drama of salvation, and the people in the audience were forced, willingly or unwillingly, to play a role with eternal consequences. They could sit there in their seats, unchanged, or they could stand up, separate themselves from their old, sinful lives, and walk to the front of the sanctuary. Either way, the spotlight was on them now. Song's simple invitation to step out, manage to erase con social con sort of conventions and distinctions. Penitents would gather on the platform with Song or he would come down and meet them at the altar where clergy and laity suddenly were no longer separated but intermingled. And more shocking still, men, women, and children would mix freely as equals beneath the cross. In the presence of one another, they spoke their failures clearly, and out loud, as Song instructed them, not shouting them, but also not timidly whispering them either. And there, in that socially porous and also gracious moment, those people became new creations. The old was gone. One need only look around the auditorium to see how different things were. Men, women, and children huddled together, speaking their deepest 
failures and shames within the hearing of others? It was unimaginable. This was definitely not the way they would have acted at home or in the office or on the street. Clearly, just looking around at what was happening, you could see that you were starting an entirely different kind of life. And squeezed into one service, wow, revivalism's format for transformation became extremely popular. Crowds flocked to see the drama. When services would be canceled or, or end for an afternoon or even stop in the evening, some people dared not leave the church building lest they lose their seat. Revivals offered laughter and tears, public shaming, and also social rehabilitation. No one, it seems, could pull their eyes away. That is why Song reported one time when he was preaching, people from India who could not understand a single word he said were still miraculously converted and physically healed. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing, but in Song's organized revivals, seeing the drama was sufficient unto salvation. Song's method for delivering the gospel through a revival was so ironclad, he could amaze his audiences by asking, what book of the Bible and what chapter do you want me to preach from? It didn't matter to him. He could make something up right there on the spot because Song was very smart, but also because the content of his message was in some ways less important than, in, than its form. Song knew every sermon had the same organization. He delivered it in three steps. People discovered they were trapped in old ways of living, stuck in the ways of sin. Number two, they were invited to embrace Jesus. So number three, they could become new creations. Let's pause for a minute and consider Song's method of contextualization the way he delivered the gospel through a revival. I'm going to invite you to think back to those opening two posters. Remember, one communicated the need to rescue old China. The other expressed the urgency of becoming something new. Song's revivals, which appeared at the same time as those posters, somehow managed to say both. Remember, he drew crowds through advertisements and banners, just like the new department stores. Audiences were greeted with fun and contagious songs, similar to those played in China's new dance halls. Song's revivals were New China. But at the same time, when he stepped forward to preach, Song was old China. He dressed in a traditional Chinese gown. He acted like a traditional Chinese storyteller. You see, Song's revivals never erased the different subcultures that existed with China, fighting for old, fighting for new, Instead, he held both together under the pressure of an organized revival. Let's now talk about the contextualization of his message. What Song did with his method, combining the new and old together, is what he also did 
with his message. They are an amazing mixture of old and new. To illustrate my point, let's look at what Song said when he preached on one of his favorite topics, going home. Home was a powerful metaphor. Almost everyone who heard Song speak was an immigrant. They'd either moved from the countryside to the city or from China to one of the ports in Nanyang. Either way, Song attacked their new, modern, urban homes. In his sermons, cities were always dangerous places. In a sermon on Lot and Abram, Song admits that Lot appeared to have the better life. After he immigrated to the city of Sodom, Lot made a pile of money, Song said, by opening many businesses. Lot Trading Company, Lot Groceries, Lot Travel Services, and Lot Banking Corporation. His daughters were society birds, and everything seemed to go Lot's way in the big, dazzling city. Even when Lot was captured by foreign kings and dragged away from the city, it didn't shake his confidence in the greatness of city living, because when Abram rescued him, what did Lot do? He ran back to Sodom. But, Song reminds us, that was a little bit like a dog returning to its vomit. Because ultimately, the city, this seat of evil, was destroyed by the wrath of God. Abram, on the other hand, always remained in the village, Song explained, away from the world, away from the city. He kept his distance from urban centers because... It was only when he was in rural areas that Abraham, quote, praised God and could praise God all day long. See, time and again, Song sanctified the countryside and he vilified the new cities. More examples, just a few. In one sermon, he depicted Nicodemus in John chapter 3 as the corrupted urbanite who looked down on Jesus, the kid from the backward countryside. Or in another sermon, Sung paused to point out that Jesus healed a blind man only after leading him outside the city. Quote, From this, we can see that flourishing cities will impede people on the road to salvation, end quote. Song's messages resonated because his hearers had discovered that living in the city was not easy. Immigrants had to deal with great economic uncertainty. Low pay and sudden job losses were common. They witnessed and were sometimes victims of violence. And sickness spread easily in the densely packed cities. So these immigrants rotated through just a brutal cycle of illnesses. And many immigrants were bored. Their work in the city was meaningless, an endless repetition in an assembly line and their off-work hours were difficult to fill on a tight budget. The city looked great, but seldom fulfilled its promise. So people wanted to escape this evil city, but going back to their villages was unrealistic. China's interior was devastated by famine, flooding, banditry, warring generals, marauding soldiers, rioting peasants. Poverty in villages was so bad 
it was popularly believed that a beggar in a city was better off. At least if you, quote, begged in the city, you could get meat or fish soup in the village. All one could hope for was cornmeal, end quote. So where could people turn? Song rejoiced to share it. Hui Jaba, go home. But the home he was referring to was not their villages, but in their hearts. God's home was accessible now. God, like a, God the Father, could rule in their hearts like a wise father, whereas Jesus was more like a mother. Song described Jesus as weeping over sinners, cuddling the brokenhearted, and cooing with delight over his baobe. God the Father and God the Son offered a beautiful heavenly home, Song called it, right here and now in the city for all who believe. It was difficult to resist, therefore, when Song asked, Do you want to go home? Raise your hands if you want to. I'm the first. It was an extraordinary act of contextualization. In a country where subcultures were fighting over what was better, old China or new China, Song transcended them both. Yes, he attacked the new cities as evil. And yes, he extolled the old ways of life in the village as pure and good. But ultimately, he did not make his listeners leave this new city to go back to the old countryside. Instead, he let them have both. If people accepted God into their hearts, they could enjoy the good and pure old life even as they dwelled in the rotten new city. God was big enough for both. Contextualization of messengers. In the previous sections, I have tried to demonstrate that Song's method for sharing the gospel, organized revivals, and the content of his messages such as inviting people to go home, manage to hold old and new together. Song's capacity to bridge different subcultures in China was nothing short of brilliant. But his real genius was not in how he contextualized the gospel, but in making his audiences do it. At the end of a revival, Song addressed the people who had walked to the front to embrace everlasting life in Jesus Christ. Now remember, they had gathered as a socially strange group. Clergy and laity stood together. Men, women, and children intermingled in odd ways, confessing their sins to one another. Those who repented were acting different, but Song warned them they weren't done yet. One more thing needed to happen. The only way to know if you were really changed is if you tell others about it. Something you would not nor could not do before you met Jesus. He told those saved to team up with at least one other person, go out at least once a week, and tell others about Christ. You could do that on the streets, in homes, in prisons. It didn't matter. Just tell others about what God had done in your life. Unlike pastors and missionaries who were paid to preach, Song insisted that these evangelists pay for the privilege to preach. Every week, all the members of a team should take up a collection to buy tracks or pay for their travel expenses. 
participation would be costly, Song admitted, but it was the surest way to become truly different. Before he sent them out, Song gave people the chance to practice. He intuitively understood that someone must name God as the agent of change in their lives. Otherwise, alternative explanations fill the void. For example, if a person is sick, is prayed for, and recovers, but doesn't say, God healed me, then that person's recovery will be explained as maybe just the natural course of the disease, spontaneous remission. Maybe it was the lifting of an evil curse or the effects of some kind of medicine. It requires someone to say, God healed me or God saved me. Otherwise, divine intervention just gets explained away. So, on his last day in town, Song would insist that all who had experienced the transforming touch of God step up to the podium and proclaim it. Keep it short, he urged them, because the lines were always long. And few words were all a person needed. As Dr. Song put his hands on me, one man explained, I saw a red light follow his hands and come down. Six years of asthma were cured all at once. Others even testified without words. One man simply pulled off his shirt to prove to others what God had done. The giant growth that had been a visible lump under his shirt was now entirely gone. Convincing testimonies like these were always brief and highly personal. They expressed gratitude for the unique grace of God at work in their lives. Troubles, if I can call it that, troubles tended to appear when someone would borrow language from the Bible to talk about what God had done. Quoting John chapter 9, one blind boy shouted, I can see! I can see! But when he failed to identify how many fingers were held before his face, people just dismissed it. Well, he's never seen anything before, so how could he recognize the number three? It was only after Song left the city that the boy finally admitted that he was trying to believe himself or quote the Bible into as a way to make himself see. In another case, a missionary wrote home enthusiastically about Song's services in an article titled, Blind Receives Sight, The Dumb Speaks, a reference to Jesus' ministry from Matthew chapter 15, verse 31. Two girls, he reported, proved that Jesus still healed just the same as in the Holy Land during Bible times. But it was his more sober colleague who quietly pointed out that the blind girl didn't really have much control over her eyes and the dumb girl still didn't have great control over her voice. So were they healed? It was hard to say in such cases. So most people used biblical language to mask the ambiguity. This sort of borrowed testimony, a testimony that uses the Bible's words or someone else's, reminds me of how missionaries in Tahiti in the 19th century decided when a person had become a faithful Christian. The test was not how much scripture a person could quote or how well someone could repeat the catechism. 
What was important was whether someone could express the gospel in his or her own words. That was the real test of faith. And I would argue a beautiful expression of contextualization. And Song seemed to understand that too. He empowered people to speak about the work of God in their own lives with their own words. The multiple cases of tuberculosis that Song faced help illustrate my point. Now, TB was a linguistic nightmare in China. The first Western doctor to translate the idea into Chinese used the word Lao because it had similar symptoms to what he called consumption. That is coughing, shortness of breath, phlegm, fever, vomiting blood, etc. However, in Chinese medicine, Lao was caused by evil spirits that fed on a person's heart and lungs. When the bacteria that causes TB was found, Japanese doctors suggested a new name, Fei Jie He, because it would get rid of superstitious ideas about evil spirits and replace the outdated ideas doctors had about consumption. But what should someone then call TB? If someone said, Fei Jie He, it was strictly scientific, but the words made no sense to Chinese patients. Alternatively, if someone called the disease Lao, it introduced unwanted ideas that were outdated or introduced evil spirits. Medical doctors may have struggled with this linguistic problem, but Song's approach completely sidestepped it. He encouraged those who testified to God's work in their lives to use whatever words they wanted. So in one afternoon, different people spoke about having Fei Bing, Lao Bing, Lao Zheng, Lao, and Tu Xie, all probably referred to tuberculosis, but Song recorded their self-diagnoses exactly as they spoke them. He did not try to convince them that, in fact, they had suffered from Fei Jie He. He simply jotted down their own terms for their own illnesses. Whether a person was thinking they had consumption or fighting an evil spirit or had little bacteria in their lungs made no difference to Song because God, after all, could defeat all those enemies. And the same can be said for evil forces at work in someone's life. Song didn't care if a person said God delivered him from an addiction, from a mental illness, from the gambling devil, or from demon possession. It didn't matter because Song was confident that God's power was at work to cast out all evil, whatever its name, or however it appeared. He encouraged people to express God's saving power however they wished. That meant not everyone had to be a genius who could hold old and new China together like Song did. Almost inevitably, a convert moved in one direction or the other. They called TB by its old name or its new name. No one did both, but it didn't matter. By speaking of their transformative encounter with Jesus in their own words, and not just parroting biblical phrases, 
They were naming God's deliverance in their own particular context. They contextualized the gospel. And some did that when they shared it for a subculture that sought to preserve old China. And when others talked about what God did, they were sharing it with people in a subculture that hoped to create a new China. Either way, it was Song's audiences who became the true force for contextualization as they discovered the power to narrate the gospel in their own lives. Let me conclude. Contextualization, I have suggested, is more complicated than distilling the gospel to a single truth and then repackaging it for a single culture. The gospel is simply too big for that, and cultures are too diverse. But that raises a thorny problem. How do you do contextualization? The very act of making the gospel relevant for some means it becomes potentially irrelevant for others. A few people, of course, find ways to speak good news to the competing desires of different subcultures. Song Shangjie is a prime example of that. And his success at holding contradictory things together in a single revival may help us understand why he was so popular. However, I argue that his real gift in contextualization is not in his method, nor in his message. What makes Song especially important and relevant is the way that he proves good contextualization is not reserved only for a few geniuses. Song proved his hearers could do it. They had to find ways to express what God was doing, where God was encountered, and why God's presence was transformative. They had the responsibility to speak God into their own stories. And to do that is to contextualize the good news. May I ask, are you doing the same? I submit that as we think about the urgent task of contextualization, we worry less about ourselves and the mechanics of what we are doing to contextualize our messages and consider more how we can empower people and give them the opportunity to testify to God's work in their own lives. That makes God come alive, not just in our context, but in all the contexts in which God's people live. And that is the kind of contextualization that matters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ireland, for your presentation. Um, I really appreciate your clarity in presenting about John Song's story and his way of contextualize the gospel. Um, now is the time for uh, Q&A, uh, but I'd like to start with the question first. I'm curious of how you got interested in John Song. Was there a story? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dean Swan, that it's, it's a bit of an embarrassing story for me because it happened when I had come back from Taiwan and I was thinking about doing some more uh, study on Chinese Christianity. And I visited a professor to talk about possibly studying with him. And as he listened to what I had been doing in Taiwan and um, some in mainland China, he said, well, have you heard of 
Song Shangjie or John Song. And I thought about it and I said, no, I don't think so. And he acted like, oh, that's fine. Um, no big deal. Let me just tell you, he was this interesting man who grew up in China, went to the United States, went to Union Theological Seminary, ended up going to an insane asylum, and then was sent back to China and led more people to believe in Jesus Christ than any other Chinese person in history. But, you know, it's okay that you've never heard of him. I, you know, I, I felt so stupid. Here I was saying, I want to learn more and study Chinese Christianity. And I couldn't even name who John Song was. But maybe partly out of embarrassment, but then also as I started reading about him, I just became so fascinated. Who was this man? And that then started what ended up being 10 years of working on his story. Wow. Yeah, I noticed that your uh, PhD dissertation is on John Song as well. Yeah. Um, okay, for, uh, for the rest of it's time for Q&A, if you have a question, um, Feel free to unmute yourself and ask Dr. Ireland, or you can put your question uh, in the chat room. Um, you can do it in Chinese. I can translate uh, for you into English. Yeah. Dr. Ireland, can you turn on your uh, camera, please? I am sorry. <laughs> there, would you like your face now? <laughs> OK, great. We can see you now. Yeah. Well, I'll ask a question uh, because I'm, I have a lot of questions, a lot of comments. Thank you so much. It's a lot to think about. I guess I'll just ask one question, though, is how conscious do you think John Song was of his contextualization of what you just said? Was any of it conscious, how he developed, you know, from the early years where it wasn't effective and then he became more effective? Was he conscious of that? And particularly his ideas of contextualization, of getting people to oralize, to speak out the gospel. Was he conscious of what he was doing, do you think? It's really hard to say for sure, um, Dr. Cook. He, he certainly writes little about that in his journals, um, so it's difficult to say for sure. But in observing sort of the transformation over the years, I would say that he was very astute at reading the feedback that he was getting from audiences. Um, and so he could see when what he would often write about is whether he moved an audience or not. That was his language. Um, he, that mattered to him. He would adjust uh, hour to hour almost, depending on what he was seeing with an audience. So he was, in a sense, tweaking his message until he found the right one for the people who were in front of him. And he could do that because he could see how they were responding. You know, if he invited people to come forward, repent of your sins, and no one came, it was pretty obvious he didn't hit the right note that service. So he'd go back and by the evening, maybe have it worked out. Sometimes it would take longer than that. It might take more than a week, but usually he could eventually find a way that meant something to people. But if you were asking him, are you contextualizing the gospel? I think he would just scratch his head and say, I don't know what you're saying, but I am finding a way to preach effectively. Um, the second question about his audiences and getting them to speak it out, I think there was, um, I, I do, again, I don't think that this was necessarily him thinking out in his office chair. How do I multiply contextualization. But I do think there was a deep intuition that it's a critical part of the faith development, these people who are embracing the gospel, that they need to be able to speak it in their own words and share it with the people in their lives. And by really insisting on that, in the, in the form of even saying people were not saved until they witnessed, um, he made this an essential part of their faith journey, and I think was significant in the, the spread of the revival that he was part of. Dr. Arlen, when you speak about these um, revivals that um, John Sung held, or maybe even Bethel, 
What was the typical follow-up from the local church? How did they support these new converts and believers? What was the typical follow-up? You know, how did they place all these new believers into churches? I'm just curious. Right. That's a really good question. In most cases, the relationship with local churches was was amazingly strong. Um, they all seemed to recognize that this was a benefit for all of them. Um, and so you would see records from the same city with people saying, we now have five evangelistic teams in our church. People who were at John Song's Revival, they've organized and they're going out every week. And the church down the street could say, we have seven new teams. And everyone sort of seemed to, to benefit um, from that. In the very rare case, and there were maybe three times, I'm thinking, I know two off the top of my head, but I think there's a third where churches really fought John Sung on his revivals. He did um, sort of almost command that they pull out of the churches and create their own church where they could follow up the, the instructions that he had given them. Um, and, and in those cases, the local churches were devastated. I mean, you see the attendance records and before John Sung came, they had 500 members. And after John Sung came and the people left their churches, they would be down to 150 members. Uh, they, they just couldn't compete. He, he definitely would win in those head-to-head -head competitions. But like I said, most of the time, uh, churches were excited, eager, and even part of that preparation process that I described, they would be the ones who would place the advertisement in the local newspaper. They knew John Sung was coming. They invited him. They would team up, usually all the churches in one city, to say, let's get our people to go together. They would print out the, the pages that they would hand out on the street. So they were part of this process. They were preparing for it, and so they could then receive the fruit of the revival, um, usually very well. I have well, Oh, I read uh, uh, one time, that may be the few times he was really, uh, he again, uh, he got really, um, the, the local church really hate him. Uh, during his trip, in, they call Sanshan a trip in, in Canton. So Zhongshan, Guashan, and uh, Taishan. So he had, a, he had this big uh, uh, the, the plan to go to the three city, but each city they called him like a madman. So the local church would not provide any uh, building, any location for him to do the do the work. So he was really upset. So he has to um, rent some place. He really has to he got no support from the local church. Yeah, I read right. that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Though there were those cases, um, and. It's interesting afterwards, when you read the records from those churches, they often write about their regrets that they had oh. fought this. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because, because so many of them then lost people in the church. And many of them would say, we, there's a kind of life in, often they would say before Song would come, he's too emotional. It's just a lot of emotional manipulation. This isn't the gospel. He's just stirring people up and then walks away, and we have the problem left over. But afterwards, they would often say, it's not just emotion. There's something in his services that we lack. And sometimes it would lead to a sense of repentance by the part of the missionaries in particular um, who would talk about, we messed up. We made a mistake. Right, yeah, in that trip, I said the, the, the San Shan trip, at the beginning, right, the local church really don't, uh, didn't like him, but at the end, he became so popular, you know, so all the church, like, they, are, they all come to him. Yeah, so it's a big change. Yeah, yeah. All right, Dr. Ireland, thank you for your uh, inspiring sharing today. Um, in the year of 2008, I went to South Africa for some ministry, and I, I get a chance uh, to uh, to visit a, a old grandma, and she say she was a fruit of John Song's ministry in South Africa long, long time ago when she was uh, still a little girl. And moreover, it happened recently. I was thinking about John Song's ministry uh, because um, the way, the special way he used to deliver. Uh, for example, um, because uh, I think so. Uh, 
when we're talking about biblical principle, we're talking about biblical principle uh, based upon the Bible, but the way he delivered was very creative. For example, he uses something called a small open coffin <laughs> to talk about ten things and relate to humans uh, things. So when you're when in your sharing, especially you are more like a cultural outsider, but you are kind of an insider to us as well. So it's very interesting to learn from you. For example, when you talk about, when you talk about the three parts of structure and talk about trap in in the thing, I think that the word the trap is a good way to good way to describe it. That's one thing. And moreover, I think um the way because um um originally the, our founder uh, the founder of us still remind us. He said nowadays um, uh, there are only 10% of the Chinese people around the world believe in Christ. So there are still a great need, huge need in terms of evangelism. I think the, the, you're sharing the good reminder to us how can we contextual, contextualize the gospel to the need of the modern uh, Chinese uh, so so they can we can realize we still have this great need in evangelism. And moreover I'm thinking about the, the way how how God used John Song to have this uh, revival movement as well. And in, in your last part of today's sharing, you're talking about messengers, right? Not only about the messages, then uh, the, the, not only the message. It seems to me the message you described is more like ice breaking. So people will know, oh, what? Not only by his uh, message is very interesting, but also come help them to convince the things, that's one thing. Then when you talk about the method, method, messages, so that's more like the, the content of the message, how to live in, uh, bring in new and new, new and old together. Then finally, when you talk about messengers, I said, wow, that's the, that's a, a, a smart way, that's a breakthrough for a revival. Because once you can multiply from one person to many people, then naturally it will become a revival movement as well. Fine. Thank you for your sharing. Thank you. And I'm delighted to hear about this person you met in South Africa. I've had the privilege of meeting some of the people who attended song revivals as I traveled around Southeast Asia in particular. And their memories are extraordinary. Uh, you know, I'm talking to someone who's 98 years old and suddenly he'll it's as if he's transported. He can still sing the choruses that were being sung at the revival and can describe the situation so um, clearly. And one of the things that I, I've thought about is I, back to maybe the, what I was talking about, the contextualization of through messengers, that by talking about the experience themselves, it's no longer just a vague memory they have had to find ways to put it into their own words. And there's something that sticks in the heart. Whereas if we just walk home and sort of think to ourselves, that was nice. Maybe we've lost something, but when we have to explain it to someone else, it sticks with us, I think, in a different way. Right. Yeah, what's that, what you say is true. When I talk with this old lady, I feel like a, her face was uh, so generous. So even today, she can still have uh, this vivid memory about it. And uh, you can even feel the fire <laughs> of the revival almost like uh, one, 100 years ago. Right? Great, right. It is amazing. <laughs> I learned I, I'm very appreciative for the message today. And I'm Chinese. I come from the mainland, China. Um, Yes, I, I have one question. Um, at the same time of um, in the in the same time uh, of uh, Dong Song, there was another very famous Chinese um, uh, picture of Watchman mm -hmm. Ni. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So uh, for him, we can um, we can lift a lot of. Uh, um, Books and information about uh, the churches at that time, but uh, the message of um, John Zong, I can found, I can find not so many, uh, I can find not so many, uh, I don't have so many sources. So my, my question is from where or how, or, or will you have more uh, resources uh, can, can give to me and 
because uh, on his words, on his um, description, his um, the, um, about uh, his about his um, his uh, all of so about his his um, his man and he is his his uh, thinking about uh, gospel or so the things about him about his his words. I I am very interested up there in his um, in, in, in in his message. Yeah. Just, yeah. More a little bit. Yeah. So one of the challenges, you know, well, let me put it positively. One of the great things about Watchman Nee is that many of the things he did, he was, you know, he was an author. He wrote a lot. So there's a, a wonderful record for him. John Song really wrote, wrote nothing except his own journal. Um, and his journal is very, I'll come back to that in a moment. But, you know, there are two sort of autobiographies he wrote, but even those he didn't write. He would, he just talked about his life and other people wrote them down for him. Um, he was too busy. He was, you know, he often preached three times a day, every day for 11 months a year, except for a travel day. So he, he didn't have time to write. Um, but what we do have are people sometimes would be in a service and they would write down his sermon and then publish it later. So we, I have uh, a number of sermons, and some of those have been compiled. Uh, nice pub, uh, a, a nice series, of, I think it's two volumes from Taiwan, contain a lot of his sermons. Um, so that's been very helpful. And some people have, have gathered those together. Um, and then various uh, other little records that you pick up. That you know, A lot of the Christian journals at the time loved to report about his revivals because they were so dramatic, and especially the physical healings that accompanied um, his ministry, that, was a, that got a lot of attention. And so there was a lot of news reports on it. Um, there is also his, his diary, and that has been, um, that's now available in, some, in an edited format that his daughter has released, both in English and Chinese. Um, you just need to, to, as you work through it, there's some wonderful stuff there, but it's just a tiny fraction of what he wrote. Um, she sort of pulled out what I might call the spiritual wisdom or special wise nuggets that, that were in his journals. But John Song, people complained that he maybe had an obsession with writing in his journal. That's all, all he wanted to do. And when you try to read through it, I can understand some of the, the sense of obsession. You know, he'll write how many times he scratched his leg in a day. Um, he'll talk about how many, uh, you know, maybe steps he took from one building to the next. There's so many things that are just not that interesting to the many of us, but he records it all in great detail. Um, so that is available and most of it has been scanned now at Yale Divinity School. So if you want to read through some of the materials, you can ask for it um, and you would be in a good position to do it. They have not made it available to the public. They ask you to be researchers only. But if you say, you know, I'm a doctoral student or I'm a professor, um, they would be willing to share some of that with you. Dr. Ireland, I, uh, recently I read a, a person uh, he's in Los Angeles, his name is Joseph. He passed away a few years ago, but he uh, wrote a book. His mother, mother named Liang Qi, his mother was, in, you know, many years ago in Qingdao, so uh, uh, during the, the revival. So she was converted to uh, a Christian, and she led her whole school into a uh, Christian. And uh, her, this, this little girl, she, at that time she was only like 16 years old, but she can speak Cantonese because they're from Canton to Qingdao. So right. Dr. Song invited her as his translator. Mm -hmm. So she joined their team. So that's why she went to uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Canton uh, during the right. session. Yeah, and, they, and the, at that time, Dr. Song said, no, I suggest you don't get married. So you, you know, give yourself to God. But then this girl, when she came back, as when she went back to Qingdao, you know, there's someone come to host her, so she get married. 
But what I'm saying is, so she became very good friend uh, with Doctor uh, Zhang Song and his wife. So, so, so in in, in Joseph's book, he wrote like uh, during the last three years, last two years, uh, Doctor Song's life in Beijing, Xiangshan. So when he was very sick, so he right. actually wrote he actually wrote the book. I don't know if you know that. So he I, has I, Ezekiel. Yeah, Ezekiel. I haven't so heard that. Thank you. you heard that? I don't think so. You mean not? Yeah. So that book actually, uh, her doctor, uh, his daughter said that that book is a is a, a high. The, the, the very it's very good. But I don't right. know. If, I don't know if they published. But this information really is from their close friend. So Joseph, the mom went to uh, Doctor Stone's funeral. Not wow. funeral, I'm sorry, not funeral. Before he died, he passed away. So right. she was with him. So she, she there is a lot of information there. So maybe that, later on. That's I, fantastic. Thank you for that lead. I I hadn't heard of that book, so I will certainly be looking for that. Okay. Well, I'll send you. Thank you. We have a question in the chat room. Uh, it says, are there any elements of Song's contextualization method that could be applied in writing? Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Hong Song's method is for verbal delivery. Right. Questions right. about can we translate that into writing. <laughs> That's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about it. If I was in the classroom, I would return the question to the person asking it and say, Help me think through it. I imagine there could be some ways. As I was saying earlier, I think one of the most powerful things is finding a way to express what God is doing in our own words. And so even by keeping your own journal or a diary, um, or you could be trying to write for someone else a letter or something, but by something happens when we begin to actually do the work of naming it ourselves. And I know this because I think of when I'm about to write an article or a book, I feel like, oh, I know what it is, but until I've written it, I don't really know what I want to say. There's something about the process of, of putting it into my own words, so it's not just sort of a loose set of ideas, but into real words that makes it transformative. And so I would encourage us to think about that, that, you know, in inviting people to write in their diaries, write a letter to someone, but naming the work of God, finding ways to do that is really important, I think, um, for us to equip people, or it's not so much equip, it's release them to find the words that can express the, their, their experiences with God. Thank you. We have time for one question. There was one question there from Rita. Oh, it's a comment. Yeah, it's a thank you note. As she asked, what can we learn from the strategy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. He, he okay. asked, what can we learn from his strategy to encourage people sharing their firsthand experience about the gospel with others? Really good question, um, Rita. I. One thing that I think is really interesting about uh, John Sung in this matter is the way he insisted people team up. Uh, that there was no such thing as a one person team. That when you went out to tell others about Jesus, there was always at least one other person with you. Often it was teams of four or five. Um, those were more common. And I wonder if there's something about that that we could spend more time thinking about. We often, um, I think we find some comfort with, uh, with a partner or with, a, with another group that we may not have by ourselves, but also we learn from how other people are talking about their experience, learning, learning sort of the language of the faith from other people's stories is an important way for how we grow in our faith. So I wonder if there are ways that if we're saying, okay, I want to sort of adopt some of, some of John Song's method, then instead of just telling people, this week go talk to someone, maybe first, who can you find and team up with? And you can think about this together. 
um, that maybe there's a step there that we don't want to jump over. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to end with this question. Dr. Ireland, if you ever have the chance to meet John Song in person, <laughs> <laughs> yes, what, what would you want to say to him or ask him? <laughs> it's interesting you ask it because my wife and I talk about this regularly because I do believe in the resurrection. <laughs> right? So I say every week in church, I believe in the resurrection, which means I have the chance to speak with John yeah. Song at some point. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I think my first question will be, will you forgive me? Uh, I, I, I've, I have found writing people's stories is so challenging because a life is huge. Uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's infinite connections and possibilities and links. And I reduced his life to 200 pages. And, <laughs> you know, like th there's something almost criminal about doing that to someone. And even yeah. that, how much did I get it right? Did I really understand what was going on? I sometimes say, I'll be John Song's servant for a long time in heaven, um, just as a, a, a debt that I will owe the man. Um, but besides that sort of somewhat, uh, it, it's not a joking question, or, or I do, that will be my first one. My second is, I would love to listen to him talk about um, really maybe the transformation that happened in his life between New York and China. Um, I, I, I've spent a lot of my time trying to untangle what happened. And I would love to just hear him think about how does he, how did he perceive what was happening um, as he was in the Union Seminary and then was having these various and often very troubling visions and then ended up in the asylum where things just seem to go even worse um, as he, you know, he thinks he's marrying Mary and things um, and then comes back and becomes this incredible evangelist. It's just this, the transformation is so dramatic and I just told you how he writes about everything in his journal except that. Like that's the one thing that he doesn't tell us. It just sort of happens and he never told us how he got from this point to this other point. There's a sort of silence and I would love to ask him, what, what happened? How, what was your experience there where it wasn't Mary who was transforming your life, but Jesus? Um, that would be my question. Thank you, thank you so much for your presentation, for your time, for your, Q and A time and everything, and we hope you the best and for your writing, for your research, and that one day your questions will be answered. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you you're so much. Visit, sorry, you are welcome to visit us um, at the NLA. Yes. I appreciate that. I would love to do that at some point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, we would like to end with a prayer. <laughs> well, let's pray together. Lord, we pray for the uh, ministry of Dr. Ireland. We thank you for the way you called him to Taiwan and then called him to this uh, academic uh, ministry. And so we do pray for the center where he's working. We pray for Boston University and we pray especially for him, his research. And then we pray for his family, his wife and Son, Lord, we pray that you bless them and make them a powerful witness to the community they are in. Lord, be with them and bless them. Thank you again for the time we've shared this afternoon and for how much we were able to gain from this. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.